Hi, Melissa. Thanks for joining us for the Erie's 150th anniversary this year and Being Better Neighbors contribution to talking to locals. Um, can you please say what your name is and what you do? Uh, my name is Melissa Akie Wiley and I am the Deputy Town Manager for the Town of Erie. My family, so my grandmother on my mother's side is originally from Amatsu, Japan. And uh, one of my favorite family celebrations or holidays is um, in Buddhist tradition on the anniversary of someone's death, you make them dinner and you invite their spirit back into your home. And so you make a dinner and then set a place at your table for them. In our house, we call it Grammy Haru Day because her name was Haru. And we set a place for her at our table with traditional Japanese food and then we all have dinner and invite her to join us and it's just actually one of my favorite family celebrations there is something to having a dinner like that that makes you feel like the person's really come back with you mm -hmm. um, my daughter is five years old and she never knew my grandma and so it also gives us the opportunity to teach my daughter about her japanese heritage about buddhism so um I identify, you know, it's, this is a common term, you know, used by a lot of people, but intersectionality, identifying with a lot of different um, spaces. So I identify with being a woman. I identify with being Asian and Asian American. When I was five years old, I was in a pretty serious dog attack, um, which left me facially disfigured. And um, I actually also lost my right ear in that attack. And so I also identify with the disability community. Facial disfigurement is listed as a category under the ADA, and the primary reason for that is because the extreme um, reaction from society to folks with facial difference or facial disfigurement. I have had over 30 reconstructive surgeries, so how I look today is very different than how I looked growing up as a child. Um, so I really had this experience of childhood of ex really extreme social rejection, um, which I think really shaped who I became as a person and who I became as a leader. I think it's so important that people have ownership over their own story and experience. So I really try to center myself on what I've experienced um, and hope that by sharing my story and on my experience, other people will also feel confident to share their stories. Right. And then we can build all of those into a better community and government. Since the basically 1800s, all the way up until the 1970s, most cities in the United States had uh, municipal laws that are sort of deemed as a group called the ugly laws. Um, and these laws, which were municipal laws, which I think is really important, especially in the space of local government, basically said anyone who was, um, and the, the language is really harsh on these, maimed, deformed, disfigured, or unsightly in any way is to be banned from society. And so because cities had these laws on the books, what it meant was that people who looked like me, um, it was illegal for us to be out and about in society. Um, it meant also that employment ended up looking like maybe being in a circus right. or something like that, where, where your, your monetary value was people making fun of you or looking at you, or you were hidden away from society. These laws weren't fully eradicated until the ADA in the 1990s. And so I think it's important for people to know that um, society really has a long way to go to accepting folks with disability, especially people who, who look visibly different. Um, and accepting us in the community and in restaurants and in rec centers and those kind of spaces. You know, I think the thing I thought so much as a child was, gosh, if only people knew me, if they knew my story, if they knew what happened, one of the things that happened to me pretty often as a child was my family would go out in public, like to a restaurant or something like that, and people would actually ask for their checks and leave because they didn't want to have dinner next to me, they didn't want to be in the same space as me. Um, ch uh, childhood, to be rejected by your society in childhood is actually considered a, a cognitive trauma. Mm -hmm. And so that was really, when, when a child is young, the way the brain works is the child actually can't process mm -hmm. what is their fault and what is not their fault. So having those kind of experiences in childhood, I thought that I I was at fault and I thought I was ashamed to society. And so it really left me with this deep sense of shame and, and fear. And it took a lot of years to really process um, the way society treated me was the fault of society and that no child, especially a child who's injured, deserves to be treated so poorly by their own society. Um, and so it left me with sort of this this feeling of injustice 
and what it feels like, especially to be a child and rejected by your own society. And so I grew up thinking um, we need more adults who understand what it feels like to be marginalized, what it feels like to be young, what, how it looks to create a healthier society from laws to our, to our community events, to all of those spaces. And so I think it just really left me feeling like we need more people in leadership and government who fundamentally have empathy and um, a desire to learn the experiences of others and build those into our policies. When I was a kid, I used to always tell people, I just want to write to the President of the United States and ask him to make a law that all adults be nice to children. Like, can he just do that? And that was sort of the beginning of me feeling like, who, who is in power to start to to tell these stories um, and then at a certain point you know you think to yourself well maybe it's me you know if you don't see right. anyone like that doing those things and you sort of say oh I'll, I'll do it I'll be the person to try to do it as far as I know and I've done a fair amount of research on this so I feel like I can say this with pretty certain confidence um, I believe I'm the only facially disfigured woman to lead local government at an executive level so there just isn't a lot of I don't have a lot of community really in this space. There's not a lot of women um, in these positions nationwide. Uh, still the percentage of women in this role and my role in particular centers around somewhere between 20 and 30%. Um, and so small percentage of women leading at an executive level and an even smaller percentage of women with a visible um, difference or disability. So I'm a person who's always been really inspired by art, particularly music. I think especially when you're a marginalized person or a person that's not sure where to find themselves in mainstream society. I really turn to books and music and art and those types of things. And I grew up in Boulder and there was really no one like me, no one having my same experience. It took me a while to realize that I was a part of the disability community. When I was a, a kid, I just didn't really know where I fit. And one of the most inspiring people to me as a kid was Bono from U2. Oh. And, um, he came out, so it was 92, I believe, when this album came out, but it's Octum Baby, and the, one of the title tracks on the album was the song One. And mm -hmm. I remember hearing that song for the first time, and just the, the pain, but also the desire for a higher form of love, the desire for justice. I just felt like at the time I didn't know anyone who was speaking so directly to injustice in the world and speaking so bravely to our ability as humans to overcome that and to find some reconciliation in that. I also struggled a lot with my faith as a kid and I felt like that music really spoke to me of like almost an anger for, for having a life that was so different than the life that other people had and feeling like that why me type of thing. and. And that music and that sort of message really spoke to me. So I think the catalyst for me was really finding inspiration in art and finding inspiration in people in society that maybe I didn't know, but I, I could tell even in those years that a group like you 2 um, was a catalyst for something changing in the world. And it made me have faith that maybe it wasn't my generation, but maybe it was a generation in the future that would start to push on who had value in society. One of the hardest things for me is I have a, a five-year-old daughter and people have made comments about my face in front of her. It's hard to describe how heartbreaking it is to uh, be a parent with a visible disability already. You're sort of heartbroken for your kid and you know that they're going to have to live this life with you. So she and I have had a lot of conversations about how I look different, what happened, you know, all of those things. But I did have an experience um, in a coffee shop where a couple of people, I overheard a couple of people talking about my, my face and they, they said, I feel sorry for her daughter. She, she doesn't, she should have never had kids. And it just, I didn't say anything. I was with my daughter. I could sort of hear them, but you know, it just makes me really sad that people could look at me or a person. Um, obviously I'm a person who's been in an accident. I feel like you don't have to know what happened. You can just look at someone and know that person was in some type of accident. Um, and it makes me sad that someone would look at me and not have empathy for that. I think all of us maybe are only, you know, there but for the grace of God. Go all of us. You know, all of us have the ability to be in an accident. And so I just wish people could look at me with empathy. Um, not need to know what happened to me, but just know that something did happen to me and give me that grace. And I think it's a really sad thing that we have in society where we still have this sort of foundational belief that maybe people with disabilities or people who look different aren't deserving of love 
aren't deserving of being parents, um, aren't deserving of leading the town. And so I always hope that I'm in this role, I'm visible, that maybe I break some barrier that people maybe get to know me and see that I'm, I'm a good person. I'm working really hard. I, I really, um, you know, I have a master's degree in public administration. I'm passionate about this work. I'm committed to it. I like to think I'm the type of person you'd want to leave your town. Um, and I would hate to think that people would, would maybe assume I wasn't worthy of that because I'm also a person with a disability. A lot of folks in the community also have kids with disabilities. And I hope um, we can think about those kids growing up and going to work and, and showing them, like, you can do anything. You can be a parent, you can have a job, you can do all those kind of things. But if we treat people who are already in this roles um, in such an antiquated, disdainful way, it, do it doesn't leave even any room for all of our kids that are also living with disabilities. And at times they've made me question, like, is this the right place for me to work and live? Um, would it be better to live someplace where there were more diversity? Um, and when I came here, actually, I, I called a friend who um, leads a lot of uh, DEI work and I said to her, it's, it's really hard, you know, people make comments about me, they're dismissive of me, it's hard to live your gifts when you feel like people automatically dismiss you. And she just said to me, there's where it matters the most. Like if you stay in the places where people maybe have not had experiences with people with disabilities, um, maybe there's an opportunity to change. Maybe it really matters here, um, where people can see that people with disabilities are are fine and are able to live full, rich lives. And maybe we need to feel that and see that in the area. It's a place that I think needs it. Much of the work you're doing here, you know, allowing people to tell their stories, allowing people to share their lived experiences. One of the things I find, um, even sometimes when I share my story is people will say, well, that didn't happen, or it's not that bad, or certainly, you know, you know, there, I think there's this, this natural instinct, which I do, I do think comes from a, a piece, a place of compassion to just want to sort of minimize, like, oh, calm down. It's not that bad. And actually, I think what people truly need in any space is to feel really heard and seen. And I think that's what the greatest friends and neighbors and all people do. Like, if you share with me a story, um, my response should be like, thank you for telling me that. And, and thank you for trusting me. And thank you for being in relationship with me. Um, and, and, you know, all those kind of conversations. So I think how we start to do that is allow people to share their stories. And when people share their stories, say thank you. What more can I do? How, what more can this community do to support you? We cannot live every experience, uh, but we can listen to every experience. And we can recognize everyone ex everyone's experience is true and honest and heartfelt. We have this tendency to just say that's not true or politicize it or whatever it is. Um, I think that's just the times we're in. But you know, if I say to you, um, I lost someone important to me, it would be kind of ridiculous if you said, well, that's not true. That's not that bad. You know, that's just so dehumanizing, but we tend to do that in this space. Um, and so I think the best thing we could do is say, tell me your story. And then when someone does say, thank you for telling me that, and what more can I do to make this a great community and place for you? Um, now that you've had the decency to tell me your truth, I'm going to have the decency to take your truth and incorporate it into every space I can and to recreate communities that are based on real stories.